Okay, I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to sort of come in on to particulars in a sense today, and I'm going to reveal, although you probably guessed, some of the things that last time I only showed as plans, dry plans, without the architectural implications, although I, th or rather, rather the visible implications of the plan, although. I think the examples are very well known. I remember showing you this a couple of weeks ago, the plan of the Johnson House, the glass house. And in fact, I think a very important aspect of it is that however quasi-rational the plan is, the important thing about it is its transparency. And of course, it would be possible, fairly obviously, to have a building of exactly the same plan form. Uh, and only if you're very familiar with reading plans would you realize that the skin is rather thin and perhaps it might be glass. But of course, it needn't be. It could, it could be opaque panels. We know it isn't because there it is and it isn't. And suddenly, the significance of something which on plan is a relatively small element, though eccentric to the rest, that is to say the circular element, becomes, in fact, extremely dominant. And even how far you pull the curtain becomes a considered issue if you make that kind of architecture. And also, it could be said that the trees themselves, though behind the building, uh, are readable as part of the composition or to be taken into account. And this is really the point. It's not just how you organize it, but how you interpret it. And the other building, which is always sort of referred back and forth to it, Mrs. Farnsworth House, which admittedly is a, is a slightly more composed condition. It, after all, has to deal with the two the two pavilions, though transparent, actually does something else as well. Also, in, a, in an American wood, although the rather different kinds of tree, the trees are more insistent. The, the atmosphere is more closed. You backtrack two picks. This is an open condition. The trees, apart from the first four or five in the foreground, are away, and a kind of mist of trees, whereas everything happening here is closer in. And in, sort of what is interesting is that the glass box is not just a glass box, in the sense that the one pavilion is just a raft, really, as a preparation, as a rather heroic preparation to the main pavilion. And the other main point is that the, the structure itself is more insistent. Now, if we were to compare it with the buildings that you see out of the, the window, or, or many buildings, it, at first sight, you say, insistent structure? No, it's very discreet. It's just a few white columns. It's discreet until you compare it with the other one, which only really emphasizes the corner. Here, there's a reiterant placement of the column. And again, it's a question of degree. And the point I really want to make is a very simple point, which is much architecture is not just the question of the point of departure or the way in which the thing organizes itself or just which camp you come from. It is a question of degree and even, dare I suggest, tailoring. They're both white, they're both glass pavilions with trees, but it's how you do it. And there's a certain sort of tipping point at which in this context and in this conversation, the vertical structural members become quite resonant. I showed you this also extremely known building as a piece of organization, as, a, as almost a generic project, 
which was imitated by many for some years, of the service space and the served space. The served space, the laboratories, the big squares, and the service conditions, which were these blocks of stair or elevator or whatever ducting that were attached to them, appeared to have the structural significance, although if you then look closer, you see there are pairs of real structure accompanying them. And Louis Kahn kept it simple. In fact, he, he exaggerated the simplicity of it so that the served space, or if, which you can just see in the, the gap between, uh, actually does have a spandrel panel and doesn't have that high a window. It's nothing like as, as glassy as these buildings. Nonetheless, by comparison with the exaggerated, the total solid blocks, it still looks light. So it's a question the context in which the condition finds itself. I showed you this diagram last time of the Staats Gallery in Stuttgart by Sterling. And I think I mentioned the, the thing that is of interest to those who like organization and theater, the question that the public can circulate round the drum and disappear up the hill without ever going into the uh, without ever going into the museum. And the mu it's like one world living within the other. And yet, after that, it is simply a U-shaped, rectangular U-shape with a circular shape within it. The same proposition which Asplund did with his library, but, but sort of reversed out. But it's what you do with it. And at that period, Sterling was the, was the sort of key figure of, of really doing naught, big, naughty things. He was a big, naughty man. He was a fat man who got up to all sorts of naughty things in his personal life and also in his architectural life. And he enjoyed the fact that he would do a series of buildings in Germany and the German architects would sort of love him and hate him at the same time. They were always rather jealous of the fact that he could just do naughty things and the sort of Ungers and so on of the world would sort of say, why is it that the world likes Sterling and they don't like me? Uh, because they, 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 couldn't, they took themselves too seriously. This has always been the English relation to Central Europe or, or mainland Europe. It's, it's, it, we like pissing about and they don't or they take everything very seriously. We, the, the more they take it seriously. What somebody like Sterling, I think, enjoyed to do was to actually understand German neoclassicism rather well. He could have done it if he wanted to, and he then deliberately poked fun at it, which they found sort of put them on the back foot. And here you see him making... And what is, I think, the most hilarious thing is if you want to go and see that green window, all you have to do is to go to home base in West Kensington, and they cribbed it completely. I think that's right. I think it's probably the first time I've ever in many, many lectures suggested that uh, for research purposes that you go to a crappy imitation at, at a DIY store uh, in order to save yourself the airfare to Stuttgart. But it is true. Uh, it became, in its period, it was used for all sorts of Audi ads and films and things selling, selling bottled Coke or whatever it was, and was borrowed by the designers of the home base in West Kensington. I think that is true architectural popularity. Uh, though it's interesting that Sterling at the moment is treated with great suspicion and embarrassment by many architects. I think it's cool not to like Sterling in this country, though it is interesting that Yale has recently given him a big exhibition and a, another big exhibition will happen in this country. And I will be very interested to see what is the effect upon your generations of this, this curious man who is out of period, to, dead and can't answer back anyhow, uh, but out of period at that point, probably historically too early, too early to come naturally back into fashion. I'm, I'm intrigued by such, uh, such things. 
And there's the building again. I was once standing on the other side of the street in Stuttgart, after this, maybe three years after the building was built, and I was watching the effect of motorists and motorcyclists. And one motorcyclist nearly fell off his bike because obviously it, it, it affects the system in middle Germany when you have a pink pipe. I think I said to you last time that I grew up at a certain period in Ipswich, Suffolk, which is a sort of fairly boring industrial town in, in out of the Midlands, but it's a Midlands town that happens to find itself in East Anglia. Uh, and then I saw this building many years after I'd left the town, and I could not believe it. It is very odd if you, if you live in an English provincial, or any provincial town, and that, that steadily stays with itself. And then something extremely high octane comes in, dumped in, in the middle of your town. I'm sure it happens if you you know, live in San Antonio, Texas, or if you live in, in I don't know, Idaho or, or, or Wuppertal or somewhere. If somebody suddenly comes and drops something in, which is certainly not contextual, and yet in a funny way it was, because it was mirrored, it was an early, it was black, it's black glass that mirrors the architecture, so-called, of the surrounding buildings. And at night, it reveals itself. That's also the other trick. In daytime, it's black glass. So you can't really, unless you put your nose very close to the window, you can't see what's going on inside. And then it, it theatrically puts the lights on, particularly in the long winters that you get in Ipswich. And suddenly there is this uh, very, very elegant interior. And of course, as I pointed out before that the, the, the joke of the joke is that, in fact, this wobbly shape and this black glass and this mystery conceals a fairly rational, almost bog-standard plan inside, a rectilinear plan with sort of mat, you know, matching, echoing staircases and so on. Um, this, which is Shishkovitz and Kabalski, making uh, a, a building which is all to do with shift. And it looks, you, you look at this plan and you say, hey guys, why didn't you just make it straight? Because once it, it, the shift doesn't do a great deal for the originality of the organization, except it puts it on the skew. And, and it's one of those things, I, I often like to sort of have a conversation with a project and say, hey, what, what do you do now? What do you do now, Shishkovitz and Kowalski, who are interesting architects, who uh, she was for a long time teaching in Stuttgart, and they work out of uh, Graz, actually. And they use part of it to have the inside-outside space. It's as simple as that. Nor most of their buildings are much more frantic than this. You may think this is pretty frantic, but it's only frantic in one kind of way in the, in the sense of its geometry. From then on in, it's, it's really rather straightforward, but here they're being less frantic with the architecture, with the, with the surface expression, and using the extraordinary condition of this, this uh, exploding plan. This is a building which is intriguing because it's an enormous building. It's a building which, if you look, has really two pieces to it. There's a line about two-fifths of the way in from the left, which really separates off all the uh, behind-the-scenes stuff, the training center, the preparation rooms, the rehearsal rooms, and so on and so forth. Then we have the stage. Then we have the opera house proper. Then we have the foyer. And then we have various toilets and so on. And you enter from the bottom of the drawing here. And now I think there's probably hardly anybody in the room that doesn't know what's coming next, which is this. And the discussion always in Oslo and out of Oslo is the whole question of it as a piece of landscape, the fact that, that people, even on a bad day, will climb up the building around and down again. And in fact, that sloping part 
and the proscenium, which still pops up out of the top in the normal way of modernist theatres, uh, that runs up to about the line. And then behind the line is a fairly straightforward building. And so it's, it's very scenographic in a sense, because this face is the main part of the city, uh, and the now extending part of the city to faces the fjord. It drops into the fjord. The crowds come in on the side. The hoi polloi walk all over it. Fine. Nobody ever talks about the back. And yet, actually, there's a lot of back. The back is it's not a bad building. It's just a pretty straightforward building. And so this is a building that has decided to, to, to be what it is, which is an opera house, which is a landscape. And then all the lots of stuff at the back. And, and you know, if, if we find that, there is, there is a sort of uh, ethos that perhaps surrounded the people that were my teachers, which was that a building should be all around. That once you set up a kind of architecture, it should continue right the way around and, and be complete. Whereas, in fact, in, in the building that we, we're in now, there is a frontal architecture which gives onto the square, which is more expensively made with better bricks, and a back architecture which, which hangs out. This is really... <laughs> at a, a giant scale, the same thing. And then we have Sana, uh, probably because this is a fairly currently discussed building, you, you already know the conversation. But if you, if you didn't, or if you don't, you just dispassionately say, this is a box uh, in which Ms. Sajima and her friend put a whole lot of toys. It's a box with a lot of toys, and they're almost, by their sort of egg-like shape, they're almost rattling. You can almost feel them rolling around. If, you, if this was a box of toys or chocolates or cakes or something, sort of box that you, you buy somebody in a shop, you put it under your arm because the box lurches to the right. And maybe, if you're not careful, the, the bits and pieces organize themselves differently, then you present the box and you find they're, they're shifted. I mean, what I'm saying is conceptually the thing can do that. I, I think conceptually item one, item five, item ten, etc., etc., could reposition themselves and there's sufficient interstitial space built into the scheme that that could take place. And so what, I, what I'm intrigued about is that it takes very far the sort of Cubuse proposition that you have these curved elements that act as it, so, so to speak, as a foil to the box. Here, <laughs> most of it is acting as a kind of independent or foil to the box. And then you do the unthinkable, which is to actually even make it wobble up and down. So it starts off from a fairly rational proposition. It becomes extremely naughty, wobbles it and it can slide around. And it's, it's a wonder that the thing holds at all, except that of course it does, because then there's actually another, there is another, another thing going on, which is of course there's somebody, maybe it's her, maybe it's somebody in the office, who's saying the distance between item five, which is uh, the bookshop, and item four, which is the bank, uh, there must be a certain space between the two because the fire regulations say so, or health and safety say so, or some Mr. Yokotuku who putting out the money says so, or somebody says so. And, and actually there is there's probably a series of connective logics to the positioning. So that's a thing which, which we all indulge in, which is the difference between what you say are the rules of the game, what actually turn out to be the rules of the game, and what are the sort of conceptual parameters of the game. And we can see that actually having done the rolling, it then returns to being fairly orthodox. There's a basement, there's a ground floor, there's a major upper floor. Some things are a bit up and some things are a bit down, but actually it's just a bent sandwich. None the worse for that. And so by, by in order to shock, I then have to go further and say, Many years before, and this I think was at the beginning of the 60s or thereabouts, um, 
was an even more extraordinary building that really did appear to break the rules. And I discovered it not in a book or a lecture. I was in a car in Berlin and suddenly looked out the window and said, what the hell is that? Because I, I, I live a quiet life. I'm not familiar with very large pink pipes sitting under blue buildings uh, on green legs. For those of you that, that have a taste for these things, you could look at Chernikov. There's a book upstairs, probably still in the library if A hasn't sold it. Uh, when I was a fifth year student here, I and two friends would ask the librarian if we could look at that book. And she would watch us with the key in her hand to see we didn't nick it, because it's probably worth thousands. I suspect it may still be up there. And it's called Chernikov's 101 Fantasies. Uh, there are Japanese reproductions with the wrong color of the same book. Um, and it's, it was interesting, because that, that was a wonderful book when I was a student. And then I left and did what I did. And then we did our things in Archigram. And then, a bit after that, I saw this building. So it was, a, it was like a shock to the system. It was as if all those things I'd been interested in before and had just begun to be suspicious of and maybe thought would never happen. There it was. It was as if Chernikov really lived. Of course, it's a sensible building. It's, it's testing hydraulics. It's built for the Technical University. It is a hydraulics testing laboratory. And I guess the guys up in the blue building, a bloke sitting at computers on sort of neatly designed chairs, just like laboratories all over Germany. Except that you don't you only go up on green legs and have this thing gurgling under you. And they do repaint the pipe from time. I've been many times to Berlin. I've noticed just when it's getting very shabby, you go the next time and somebody's painted it again, very pink. This is, I think, either a bad slide or, or, or a day when it needed painting again. It is a functionalist, elemental building. Happens to have the pipe, the lab, and the legs, sort of where you would reasonably put them. But could, and, and it's also wobbling things around. But in the fact that the things are odd, the logic is extremely straightforward. Again, I come on to a few Lars Spoybrook projects. I, what I find interesting about Spoybrook in comparison with other people who are equally digitally obsessed is that he's still a sort of old, old style architect underneath it. These are still independent pods with a thing going on in each of the pods. And his internal spaces still have that almost sort of quaint. They, they could almost be sort of some old English uh, market town <laughs> in the sense of the positioning of things and, and incident. I don't know whether you would agree with that. But if you look at the plan, you can see in a funny way, <coughs> it's a traditional street and side elements plan, just like plans are often always were, except that it's swinging around and doing clever things. And he then sometimes demonstrates how you, and I'm sure some of you in, 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 the, in the A do stuff like this all the time, probably not in purple. And then it's interesting to see when he finds himself <coughs> out articulating a particular part of what should be a continuous system. Somehow, if you look <coughs> at the drawing, everybody's focusing on a central point, and there is a sort of slightly paler uh, triangular patch, almost implying that that is the old traditional door in the center of the building. But it's not a door, or is it? Like, I'm fascinated by Spoilbrook because you can see he's, he's still got some of the old school instincts. Though he's a clever guy and, and can do all this stuff. He gets more abstracted here. Okay, if you, if, if, if you push him, he can abstract it. 
But there's still a, I could still claim for it that there's a bit of the old instinct, because one of the pinnacles is much bigger than the rest. But then you know, say, ha, ah, last word up, you're in the old North European cathedral tradition. I mean, I'm deliberately forcing the point to make a point. Or here, where it would appear that the system is consistent. And again, I'm sure half of you sitting here do this sort of stuff in your sleep. But uh, there is nonetheless, then what we look at is the incidence of the, of the windows. Do you not notice that the windows increase in, in uh, quantity towards the center? So it's again, it's, a, it's not really an even building. It's say, yes, it's a continuous right one. But towards the center is a core, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is perhaps a, an arcade or a special light condition. Does anybody know this building? I, I've forgotten who did it. <laughs> This is, I, 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 I've done the ultimate sin in, in a lecture of this kind, which is to forget what I'm, I can't remember who did it. And I scanned it about a week and a half ago, and I've been very busy in between. Uh, anyhow, it's somebody recent <laughs> in a desert. And what, so none the worse for the fact I can't remember who did it. It's, it's, it proves that I just genuinely look for things that, that I'm interested in, irrespective of who did them. And what intrigues you is that apart from the edge modeling, it would appear that nothing very particular is going on inside till we see the plan. We see that actually, very commonplace particularity, row of chambers, toilets and stair, Shared common space, row of chambers, the other side. It could, if you, if you sort of straightened it out a bit, it's just a standard H-shaped flash gap connected building. Except, of course, it's saying, no, I'm not. I'm very new and I'm very abstract and I'm very white. But come on, Charlie, it is. All that's going on is that bank of room, that bank of rooms, shared common space, put them together, and then... Where you, how you crook your leg is, is the question here. And you expect it to be like the sun are building, of perhaps doing something with, with the uh, horizontal conditions. You expect that if the roof spa space, the roofscape is as interesting as that, perhaps the floors, are, perhaps there's the odd ramp somewhere, perhaps there's the odd shift in the floor, perhaps the, 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 the terrain is obviously dropping and doing some interesting things. But disappointingly, it's odd standard horizontal floors. In fact, you could put a very, <laughs> very ordinary building on top of it and probably save money. But no, do I make my point? And then this is the amateur architects in China doing the museum. And the whole spiel, rather, rather there's a sort of similarity to, to Fujimori in certain respects of look, going back to traditional methods, traditional ways of assembling walls and a sort of almost quasi-antique condition. And, and the amateur architects are obviously no amateurs. And then you look at it closely and you say, if it's that casual and traditional and you know, sort of going back to, 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 the, to our Chinese roots, Look at that bench. That's a real, real Western rational designed bench. You know, Mies would love it. <laughs> so I'm always looking at sort of useful double think. I think it's a very interesting building, by the way. But I don't quite believe the spiel. I think they're extremely sophisticated guys looking for a mannerism, which is what many of us do. This is Hitoshi Abe, uh, almost doing, and, and after he runs a school now, and he's almost doing a, a sort of classic case of 
take the, take the cake or the box, see how many cuts you can make into it that, that are useful. It's not, it's, it's, it's in a funny way more sculptural than it would be if it was, was a, a, a Liebeskind version of the same thing, I think. If you compare this with something like Liebeskind's building on the Holloway Road, uh, the, the cuts are more mannerist, whereas I think here the cuts are willful, but I think Abbe is a very intelligent person. Not that Liebeskind isn't a crook, but I think he's still not as successful as Liebeskind. Therefore, he's still thinking. And I think that uh, the, each cut becomes a sort of examination of cause and effect. It's very ob opposite from this building, I feel, that the cuts are made deliberately, not always successfully, but, but he's interested in the effect of making a cut in a surface and, and its consequences. And I come then to a little run of, 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 of projects by um, Morphosis. When working slowly towards the position of eminence that they've now reached, Morphosis have always been very interested in gyratory plans, layers, and almost a sort of plans that have gadgetry about them. You look at that plan and you, you, you want it to start moving. I think that's another subplot, which is the whole preoccupation that 20th century architects had from constructivism through people like Zaha at the time and these guys, many others, with the machine, the idea that if only an architecture could move, if only it could gyrate, if only it can encompass space. You must feel the, the compass point zazzing through the ground as those conditions are made. And I've been there myself. I, 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 I feel that when you organize a building like this, there's a sort of there's a nervousness. And the, the, the question is the degree to which the nervousness becomes a mannerism, the degree to which it is styled. And the degree which it's like with the Hitoshi Abbey also, that when this condition cuts that, there's a, there's a, there's a, a difficulty of this piece, which to a clever designer is a temptation. You almost make problems for yourself and then sort of design your way out of them, or not out of them. <laughs> you, you stay with them. You say, yep, true, it's a very funny balcony. Or, yep, it's got a thing cut out of the corner of the bedroom. Or, Yep, that isn't quite parallel with that. Isn't that great? Except that the first building I did, which had walls that were not parallel, uh, which I did with Christine Hawley, we, we, uh, we agonized over the plan and arrived at, I think, a three and a half degree shift as opposed to four and a half degree shift. We thought we were being terribly clever. And then when they built it, you couldn't see anything. It looked as if, if you look closely, it was as if the builder had got it slightly wrong because it was too near the rectilinear. Uh, only when we had the handrail going up the staircase could you see that the handrail got nearer and nearer to the wall, so something was happening. And that was a period thing. And, and we were, and, but, but the gyratory thing I find fascinating. You get certain buildings in Russia and elsewhere where there would be a, a swinging, a swinging slab or a swinging balcony or something, and you feel this, 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 the, the love of speed and the love of things doing things. And um, the term device has been used at a certain period in this school and the school up the road. People, certainly at the Bart did about 15 years ago or so, were doing devices. Uh, even when they didn't do anything, they looked as if they might do something. It's a great, it's a great I guess it's a period thing. Um, or here, where you get a very straightforward plan or odd plan, depending on, on what you want to say about it. You could say it's a very straightforward plan. There are three blocks that go out into space, which have the 
activity, the office or the living on them. And in between them, it's a servicing. Service space, service space. Simple. It holds it up. The, ser the, the servicing elements are structural. The other bits hang out. End of conversation. Or somebody might say, yes, yes, but they're, they're, they're swinging. They're, again, they've got this nervousness. And the lady who designed the building is quite a nervous lady. Uh, it's Kame Pinos. And indeed, the building then does further intriguing things. It takes the surface as a single surface. And there are really only two architectures. There is the two architectures. There is the, the Serb space, which hangs out, and the surface element, which is simple and white and concrete, and it holds it up. It's a very direct building in many ways. It's not eccentric, though there are not many buildings like it. Or here, where the whole proposition is really about roofs. This is Karl Himmelblau in Munich. And, of course, that big chunk of roof isn't solid. It's got structure inside, which is just a decision to enclose rather than to necessarily structurally enclose. And then you have flowing space that sits within it. Again, an old modernist proposition. Or here, Herzog and de Moron, who take a tower and a slab and engineer it straightforwardly. They do a certain thing with a section which they then drift the roof so that it becomes an enclosed area. What is particularly interesting, I think, is the plan. Because again, one can have two constructs upon this plan. One could say, if you wanted to be droll or dreary, it is three linear buildings linked by passageways or connectors. Bottom one, middle one, top one. OK, the top one fragments, but it doesn't matter. But then we've already seen the business of swinging a predictable plan seen it two or three times now already. But here you swing it until it almost congeals or does congeal. So you're saying there are these three element, elemental pieces of strip of building, but one of them swings in such a way that it, that it plays connector as well, but only just. So you have traditional connector here congealing connector here, congealing connector there, but the thing is so attenuated that it almost is saying that whole strip is a connector, but it's still got things going on in it. So that it's, it's, it's actually sort of working through of elemental planning, but with, with, with a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of sophistication, a lot of knowingness. So just how far can you push something that came from a certain origin before it turns into something else? And if it does turn into something else, it's kind of even better. But in a curious way, it's still in, in control. And then, as we know, it's covered either in corten or in mesh. And that's another thing, which is that the, that one decision, which piece is A or which piece is B, though they are the same color, which piece is solid, which piece is mesh, is in its impact upon the interior, of course, very major. It's a hell of a lot different going into a solidly faced room or one in which there's 65% you know, light coming through the wall. And since we're talking about mesh, then we come back to morphosis in Cincinnati who by just draping the mesh and curving the plan, turn, again, turn one thing into another. Uh, oh, I got that same <laughs> one again. Or in their San Francisco building, uh, are very confident with the kind of light conditions you get by just simply either total solid or total transparency. And and holding the light through. In New York, 
things get a little bit more complicated and they interfere with the central proposition. I think they interfere with it amusingly, but in a sense they're playing the same, would you believe, I would never thought I'd say this, but they're almost playing the same game as Sterling did in his time, which is you take a, a, a known proposition, a skin building sitting on legs with a, with a wonderful interior of moving up it, and then you make eccentricities to it, and the eccentricities become the thing that we're concerned with. Um, this is a tricky slide. It's actually two. Can you see that? It's one on top of the other. I was trying to get a summary of what you see as you look up the central space, and as you get, well, when I say central, the space is maneuvering up. What you get when you look down, what you get to look up, and of course the the thing that's interesting, if we see it just cold like this and not move through the building, it's a building really you have to move through, is we see the decoy effect of, of these trellises, these internal trellises. Uh, I think you have to be pretty sure of yourself to introduce a decoy. And at this point, the decoy almost becomes such a... Such a an intriguing decoy, that this is the thing that your eye rests upon. Now, of course, I think the Gothic guys knew about that sort of thing. People who did the cathedrals with the traceries and the clerestory lights and the, that type of light sources where the light was bounced and then came in over the, the uh, vaulting and so on and so forth. I think it was known about in those times and has not tended to be bothered with since, and it, it takes a lot of designing. And since I know the sweat that some of the people working on it went to. It's, it's not, it looks as if it's just pissing around, but it's actually quite difficult to do. Or the business of twisting the p building in general, so that Ben Van Berkel's Mobius house takes the apparently fairly straightforward rectangular rooms and pulls them around like a kind of jerking snake. This is a house, and I haven't got pictures of the actual built house, so it is built. It was done by a 23-year-old architect uh, who is now a 50-something-year-old architect, He's or even 60. He's Stanley Seitowitz, who lives in Berkeley and builds in San Francisco. But this was a house he did in the Transvaal in Africa when he was 23. And the surfaces are covered in uh, sheet metal and other materials that are found on sort of farms and typical farming uh, material. I've, I always have difficulty finding pictures of this. It's very strange. It seems to have been... He has given a lecture in this room once or twice. and. Uh, is around, you know, but this was extraordinary, the most extraordinary building for a 23-year-old. And uh, he built two houses and then cleared off to America uh, and then built many, many more buildings. But this is stunningly original. It led, it led the drifting roof thing, led to something that at one time I seem to remember calling the AA roof or the Bartlett roof, or it was a roof done by all the people I knew, but never as brilliantly as this. It, it's one of those uh, pieces of architecture then that breaks all the conversations I've been having because it's so radical <laughs> and so complete that it's not just pissing around with plans. It's not just doing the odd clever corner. It's not just sort of saying, can we m marry this with this? It's just... It's just a, just an extraordinary exuberance of, of uh, creativeness. But pulling yourself around a corner has interested me for a long time. This is Bernard Chumi pulling himself around a corner. In fact, the whole building pulls itself around a corner. It is a sort of shoe. Interesting that unlike most of the stuff I've been showing, Bernard chooses to make it very solid. That is almost out of step with, with uh, 
many people. Most people would maybe, you know, if you imagine sana, it's, 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 it's stiffer than the sana, than the sana plan, but it, you could imagine this is sort of reversed out thing, because they have a box and they put the rolly thing. To, here you have a rolly and you put the boxes inside it. But it's interesting that he makes the exterior so stiff. Or Neutlings, who makes a very ordinary rectangle amusing because he then does all these, these layers of colour on top of it, like a painting. I guess many of you know this building. And then he has one more trick up one sleeve if you then show the whole proposition, which is that, of course, it sits. <laughs> it says, I land once, but I don't always land. But instead of pulling the landing back, or pulling, he, 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 he's, he's sort of cocking a snook at, at both the total rectangular building that has predictable condition with floor, floor to floor to floor, by putting this painting on top of it. And then he cocks a snook at the idea of the, the bulk of the building sitting on the legs uh, by saying, it drops. If I wanted to drop, then to hell with it. It doesn't usually drop. It's, it's, it's sort of knowing. I find this a very interesting building. It's also rolling around a corner, which you don't notice at first by looking at the picture. It's EMBT, I think, but somebody may correct me here. I think it is post Mirais. I don't think it was one of the ones that Enrique had in any way on the drawing board at the time that he died. I think it has been done by the gang. And uh, it's a very interesting expression because it too is messing around with what to expect. It says it's a solid building with the occasional opening. It's a solid building with the occasional opening which sometimes has a surface around the opening. It's a solid building with openings that actually burst out and, and form the top of the thing. But the degree to which the topness of them, that is to say the degree of structure that still hangs on to the form, is... is, is it's neither special to the top, nor is it the top just being the solid. It's very, it's got a very curious relationship. It's also, uh, another trick I like is, is it's a building that cuts into itself. But it doesn't just only cut into itself, it does other things. So it's a, and yet it's not muddled. I mean, having listed out all those things, say, God, what are they, the guys don't know what they're doing. Cut, and they're not going to cut. Are they going to articulate the windows? They're not going to articulate. Are they wanting to make a, a roofscape, or are they not wanting to make a roofscape? And it's sort of, I will if I want to, and I won't if I don't want to. And yet there is a sort of, it, maybe it's choice of material, choice of colour. It, it actually has tremendous, uh, to my mind, tremendous consistency. It gets more quotationally Mirias, when you get inside it, it's sort of looking a bit at the Scottish Parliament and may possibly making it over complicated. But I like very much, and it's upside down, for Christ's sake, I like very much the top drawing, which is upside down. Because that tells you that there is, a, that, that actually the wall does hold the whole system. <laughs> Sorry about the upside down and the. You can go away saying, Peacock's a terrible guy, he doesn't know what. The buildings are he's showing, and he puts them upside down. Anyhow, he must be going gaga. I, I like the proposition that the fort or the castle sets up a system by which you say, the enemy is outside, the fort's strong, you can do what you like architecturally inside. I mean, we've been seeing that a little bit with some of these buildings today, where once you've set up the exterior condition, you can have. You can have a rolling plan, you can have an old style plan, you can have a sort of silly buggers plan, as long as the skin goes well. And that's what the castles did, except they had to, they, they had to do it to some purpose because there were all sorts of unpleasant people outside that you had to protect against. But once you'd built the castle, it didn't matter what you put inside. And so I illustrated that as a reminder. I couldn't find any pictures of the fort at Colombo so I borrowed two English examples to remind us that 
that castles, the whole thing about castles is, of course, that the skin is very solid. Or we have Hagia Sophia, which I had the misfortune or fortune to have to draw in axonometric and color when I was a first year student a very long time ago. That's what they made us do. I sweated over this drawing so much that I hated the building. I thought, I don't want to go and see that bloody thing. It's a pain in the ass to draw. And, and only really looked at it properly a matter of months ago. And of course discovered that here you get this, this apparent complexity aggregation of things around the object. But when you get inside, it's very simple. I was referring to this building, to which where the, uh, I think last time I just simply hoped to tantalize you by showing you a funny plan. This is a funny plan of the Munster Library by uh, a former teacher here, very influential at the time, called Bert. Peter Wilson and his wife, Julia Bollis. And they won the competition for the library in her hometown, which is Munster. And they've gone to Munster, and they've stayed there ever since. They do a number of buildings. It's an extraordinary building, and I was taken around it two years ago by Peter himself, who knows every piece of wood in that building, and every door handle, and every reason why the edge of the, the booking desk is doing what it does, and which point to every window. If you look out of this window, you will see that. And if you look out of that window, you will see that. It's, it's very busy, but an ex and, and actually very close to the kind of thing that he was doing uh, when he was teaching. And I, it's, again, rather like the Stirling building, though a little bit newer, uh, it's out of fashion. But none the worse for that. It is a, a, a loved folded, it's an A building that happens to found its way, an A building of the period that's found its way into Germany. Or, of course, there's the business of, of putting together curved condition, straight condition as a composition by Eric Mendelssohn. Uh, and very successful for that. The curved element lives itself at its level in the strata. The straight block lives itself at its level in the strata. And they are what they are what they are. So despite being thought of as a bit of a loony uh, uh, when doing his quick drawings, uh, Mendelssohn was actually in control the whole time. Very much in control, I think. He was a curious plan, I think I showed you last time, uh, from Australia, from Peter Corrigan where just about everything is going on, though it could be broken down as to be two strip blocks with a circulation on one side of the block and, and the hanging out happening on the, on the outer. But it, it, <laughs> it does it so busily and exotically. You wonder what is going to be the consequence. And if we then show a line drawing, you say, my God, has he... Has he still got it under control? Has it ever been under control? My God. Well, it's sort of, what it really is, is a series of buildings. And it's a little bit more under control than you expect it to be, even though it lurches into all sorts of candy colors and so on. He is a very talented eccentric architect, as was Fizak, who was way ahead of his time, an old man who, died about three years ago. I, I managed to meet him about two years before that. And he, he was a wonderful Spanish architect who was, uh, was sort of edged out of the scene because of his religious position. The cousin Nostra got at him and, and he didn't get much work. But, and they pulled his best building down, which you can see in the process of being pulled down. There are some wonderful, hilarious old guys around. Uh, this is Pancho Geddes in the, the Lorenzo Marx. He's now having a bit of a revival of interest with big exhibitions, and he's still alive, and he's still teaching, and he's still doing architecture. Uh, there's also um, Oita, 
who did this wonderful uh, Torre Blanca in Madrid, another marvelous old thinking on his feet. This is just a little sub-series of sort of old guys thinking on their feet uh, who should be looked at because I think uh, in many ways they're just as radical as anything else we've been looking at. Sometimes I find myself playing with the question of do you have form or don't you have form? That's about a four-year-old project. And right bang up to date, I'm just exposing myself at the end. Uh, this building we will build. We won the competition and we've signed the contract and we're about to build it very quickly. And there you can say, do I follow the rules or not? Are we a skin building? or a corridor building? Are we a solid building? No. Are we a modernist building? Don't know. Are we letting it hang out? Or are we veneering it? Don't quite know. And, when you, and this was only designed about two months ago. It's very difficult when you've only just done something recently to be objective about it. Even if you've done lots of teaching and bullshitting and, and lectures and stuff, you, you, you don't quite... And maybe it isn't any of those things, but I thought it was amusing to say at the end of the lecture, I'm in this predicament too. I, I see all these buildings and read all these books and, and do stuff. And I bet I'll be able to give a good lecture about it in about two years' time. I'll have it all pat. It is doing this, it's doing that, and it's playing off this, and it's influenced by that. I mean, I can already see one thing. And I'm, I'm not... Am I showing you the interior? No. Uh, uh, if I was showing you one particular view of it, it, it does have some, I suspect, influence from the San Francisco building by Morphosis, though I have not been in that building. Uh, there we are. So next time it's going to be the, the presentation of these things, which may be about drawing, uh, or it may include some bits and pieces of built thing, taking further this question of sort of the, the, the expression of the thing. I have to stop and rush up the street to take a, uh, whatever they call it, telecall. So thank you.